Okay, let's get started. Very good evening to all of you. Indeed, I'm really happy to have an offline lecture of this kind after nearly one year eight months on campus. Of course, uh, we did have a few, and these were organized in an open air atmosphere like environment in front of the chemical sciences building. I think it's after really a long time that we are able to sort of come together for the lecture period that we are still going through, but with all, with all the precautions in place. And we are really happy to have this uh, lecture kick started by one of the uh, renowned uh, chemists in our country, and who is also the director of ICER Kolkata Process for the Visa Ministers. And it's with uh, you know very heartfelt, heartfelt welcome to you, Process for the for the better benefit of uh, the audience and uh, the students, of course, uh, let me sort of run down a brief video of process on the ball. It so turns out I and him share a common root, right? He started off, uh, in other words, as a, as a student, he began his education in IIT Kanpur Chemistry Department as well for an uh, uh, integrated master's program, obtained his uh, integrated master's program degree in 1977. Subsequently, he moved to ACS and to work with uh, one of the very well known theoretical chemists, Professor Devashish Mukherjee. I think I'm, I'm not sure if the younger generation connects to this kind of personality. At least uh, we as students would talk about him in ACS as a very well known uh, theoretical chemist of that time, about 20 years back, I would say. He got his degree, PhD degree there, and then moved as a scientist to NCL Pune. And after joining as a scientist, he went abroad to pursue his postdoctoral studies, spent two years uh, at the University of Florida in, in the United States, and then moved to the University of Heidelberg, again, a very well known place, spent a year as a Humboldt fellow, and came back and uh, you know, carried out his research for a pretty long time 33 years, which I can see in Pune, which includes being the director of, uh, of the very well known institution in our country for you know, national chemical. Uh, laboratories Pune for five years as a director. And then he moved from there to IIT Bombay as one of the institute chair professors. And it was when he was there that he was appointed as the director of Isaac Kolkata. And it's been almost four years since he has been the director of Isaac Kolkata. In fact, I see a lot of bells from the time to time. Right? I think, uh, you know, in case I said it at the outset, as a very well renowned uh, 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 chemist, a theoretician in our country, has made immense contributions. I'm not a theoretician, but I know that he has contributed a lot to methodological and uh, conceptual developments in uh, electronic structure theory, if I'm right, and uh, computational materials chemistry is, is a name for that. And uh, by being that, and of course, he's an active publisher. Publishes even today very enviably. And over a period, he has, uh, he has guided more than about 35 uh, PhDs who are now spent as scientists in, in institutions like ISIS and uh, even IITs. So he's a celebrated uh, uh, scientist. Let me not get into the details. Of course, for his uh, astounding contributions in chemical sciences in the, in the area of chemical chemistry, he has been recognized with uh, every award pretty much that you can think of starting out with. Chancellor of the Prize. Of course, uh, this was a uh, uh, national fellowship. And he has been a fellow of all the academies. And the most recent, I think about a few years back, five, six years back, that he worked the Sasta Swim Award as well. Uh, and uh, name, name a thing, he pretty much he has, has uh, you know, he has to his name. And he's also been a you know, fellow of the Developing Academy of Sciences, was, is what we call. And within our own country, and uh, he has been the president of uh, the Chemical Research Society of India, besides let's say, having received the bronze and silver uh, medals, and only one is due, I suppose, uh, this will be at a later time. And he's also, as I said, you know, he's also served as the president of that. And in addition to all this, as I said, he's a prolific publisher, an active scientist. He has been a member of a large, I mean, editorial board members of a large number of journals, and uh, most notably, 
the journal of ACS American Chemical Science, uh, uh, American Chemical Society Journal of Physical Chemistry. This is sort of a member of the editorial board. With that, I'm left with something to talk about. Those are sort of what? No, no, no. Let me see. I think some of the words, yeah, I, I should talk about it because that's one reason why I just wrote it down. He has made a lot of contributions given in science education and research, and he has been given popular lectures on conceptual developments in content chemistry. Right? I think of you know, several forum he has been sort of promoting the content chemistry. It's very fitting that we have amongst uh, you know, such a celebrated personality in the country, uh, we have amongst us, right? In fact, uh, he is with us to help our institution. You all know, Isa Thirunantapuram has not yet exited from the so-called project mode. So we have to submit a, an advisor report to the ministry that our campus is complete in all respects and, and that the campus can be declared as being complete to allow for some better fund flow to our institution. So we initiated this a few months back and uh, the ministry has appointed him as the chairman of uh, uh, this appraisal committee. So he is here in that status and we took advantage of his visit and I requested him to give a talk to us and that's how we have process on following us. So with that uh, uh, brief rundown of his uh, astounding credentials and I may now request process on following to talk to us about innovations Innovation here is that we have a title science, 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 education, education challenges, and opportunities. This is all about. Okay. Uh, thank you, Professor Murthy, for a very kind introduction. I think he said much more than I deserve. Um, I'm very happy uh, that uh, he has invited me for his Institute of Colloquia. Uh, during a busy day, I think it's, uh, it's really exciting to address physically, as he said. I'm also aware that just uh, during this talk, it's not just a physical meeting, but there are a lot of people who are online in Zoom as well as YouTube. So it's a big challenge to actually address a hybrid meeting. I mean, online, exactly. completely online is something that now we have got used to it. And now we need to get used, adapted to the hybrid meeting. So I, I, this is a, one, of the, one of the first hybrid colloquium that I'm giving. Uh, so I'm very thankful to Professor Bhutti for inviting me. I see a lot of my friends. I must greet the online friends first. Uh, I see a lot of them, there are quite a few from my own institute, I saw Kolkata, I saw the names, uh, I, so I thank all of them for being here. I thank many others who are connected from different institutions, uh, so thank all of them for attending this colloquium. And of course, thank all of you who are physically present, and I think it's always exciting to see faces connect to uh, eyes while you talk. I think we almost lost the ability to connect to eyes, connect to face. I think it will still take time because you are all on mask. So it will still take time to fully connect. But I think I think things are opening up, as Professor Murthy said. And I'm very happy that Isa Trivandrum or Isa Tiruvannam is one of the first ISAs which is almost opening up completely. So it's very nice. And in a state which has been uh, more COVID challenged than other states in Kerala. Uh, and during during this time, many people have worried about the fact uh, that we travel to Kerala. In fact, I must tell because Murthy knows it, and I must tell all of you. This is not the first time during this period that I have come to Kerala. This is my second time, which is not bad. So I came once in July. Uh, so I'm really not uh, worried about traveling. I think you have to take care, and I'm going to say that in my talk. You have to take care today during the COVID. It's a very serious uh, problem, and please don't take it lightly. Uh, that's something that I will start the message with. Uh, with this, I will now go to the actual talk. Uh, as was Murthy has already said, the first slide is now redundant. Uh, that I am now currently the director of ISA Kolkata. I was at National Chemical Lab in Pune. And in fact, I spent 
33 years in Nassim Central Lab, Pune. So it has always been in my heart, uh, the NCA. And today, of course, ISAs are in our heart. It's not just ISA Kolkata, all the ISA family. And I think it's a great thing to address all the ISA family here. Uh, I was, of course, at IIT Bombay, two and a half years, officially five years. I was on deputation till I retired from IIT Bombay when I attained 65. So I'm quite old. And uh, it's very nice to celebrate as we get older. And uh, so IIT Bombay, of course, is another great institution. And of course, being at IIT Kanpur, you know, I have the privilege of being associated with many great places in this country. Uh, so I want to talk about what is innovation in science and education. Professor Murthy told me not to speak very technical chemistry lectures, uh, certainly not computational chemistry, of which I specialize. So it's going to be a more general lecture of how uh, the innovation in science and education, uh, what are the challenges? Because today, all of us are talking about innovation. So I first have to address what is innovation uh, as I go forward. All right, so these are the three cities in which I have stayed. I spend my time as Gaya, Mumbai, uh, Pune, of course, I must start from Pune, Pune, Mumbai, Kolkata. And I think I've just taken some typical pictures of the three cities. Uh, I think the city of Kolkata is now probably better than what it projects in terms of crowd. It's not, not as bad, not as crowded as it looks like. But I think this is a very typical snapshot of Kolkata city. Uh, of course, Pune is a city of Varas and forts. And this, this part of Mumbai, I think this part which probably projects better than what Mumbai is. <laughs> so it's a, it's a nice part of Mumbai, those who know, I think I recognize it. Uh, these are the seven ISRs, and we are here. And I said, I'm happy to say that Pune and Kolkata were the first two ISAs to start uh, in 2006, and then Mohali, and then Bhopal, and Tirupati in 2015, Rahabu in 2016. There are seven ISAs. Hopefully, ISAs will grow. And ISAs have been actually uh, uh, started with this as the uh, highlight the research and innovation. That we must have research and integrate research in education and then do research in an interdisciplinary manner. I think both are very important. The research has to be interdisciplinary. Research must be brought into the education. And will that help innovation? That's a key question. Uh, something that we are looking for. The space of innovation is something that we're looking for for a very long time in India. All right, this is just a quick snapshot of Isa Kolkata campus. We have a natural lake, 201 acres. Uh, we have built uh, our first phase of project, and uh, just as you are trying to exit, uh, we have exited a couple of years back, and I think I'm sure Isa Kolkata will not exit very soon. Uh, so I think we have been reasonably well ranked. Uh, in the NRF and other recent rankings of major index as well as science and education. So I must say, first that I suppose that has been doing very well uh, in, in, in for different parameters that all of you are following. Uh, but I don't want to go into competition of one ISA versus another because that's a my favorite coffee time discussion, but uh, not for the college. Uh, I have to say that COVID-19, and that's something that I must start, has thrown new challenges. Challenges, of course, to research, not just to practice research. Challenges to do research to come back to it. So that's my first thing I want to say. Of course, doing research itself has become challenge. So that I think there are two different types of challenge that I'm talking about. Challenge to find out COVID vaccine, which will last, be lasting, to find out drugs. But then how do you do research? Many people are suffering from doing experimental research because social distancing has, has become an issue. People have not been coming to lab in the last uh, quite a few months. So I think that has been a very big challenge. Of course, today, when you do research, one, sorry, one important thing is that you must protect environment and climate. Because after the COVID, COVID virus, I think we are very sensitive about it. So can we do innovative research now? Now that many companies start, many companies are restarting, can they restart in a way by which environment and climate will be protected. How do you bring in technological innovation? You have already seen the, the technology today. It's a hybrid meeting. And we have to keep on doing innovation and technology. Digitalization is, of course, going to be there. And of course, entire education is going online. So very big challenges in research, how uh, in, in education, how to how do you teach a digital model? 
how do you use technology enable tools and how do you conduct laboratories at least in the immediate future i mean these are some of the challenges that the covid have thrown and then of course how do you integrate research with education when the education is completely online and that is a very important challenge so i think while i'm saying science and education uh, research and education have to be combined there are a lot of challenges of course there will be a lot of opportunities that we'll see later but first of all, let me tell a little bit of the history for all the students, because it's I said, why do you do science? I think that's very important. First of all, I, because there are a lot of institutions we went to students go for technology, medicine, are they not science? Please understand that I define science in a much more general manner. So today we say engineering science, medical science. In the olden days, we used to say engineer, doctors, and so on, but everything is science. So what is science? Science is the spirit of new discovery. As long as you discover, I, to me, that's science. So science, of course, gives you a very basic experience. While you can go to many fields, you learn physics, chemistry, science, biology, geology, they all give you a platform for interdisciplinary research. And engineering science, medical science, they're all becoming interdisciplinary. In fact, just before I came, I got a phone call from AIDS director, all in the Institute of Medical Science director, do you have somebody who can, uh, who can inspect my operation theater light? It's very interesting. I said, oh, well, I'll get back to you. I just was like an OT light. So they want I mean, somebody to inspect. I mean, so it's very interesting that the science and engineering, medical sciences are all getting integrated. Academic research and, of course, teaching have been integrated for a long time. And that is how I search was established. We have been talking about research in industrial elements, and I think this is very important. But what is important to also realize is science throws upon several alternative areas, like forensic, right? If you are a lawyer, you may require science to understand if the person was administered drug, what kind of drug, what type. You have all read Agatha Christie's novel, for example, where there's a lot of thoughts. So there are other, and of course, science communication. The outreach is a very, very important activity. Taking science to the people. So there are several alternative science careers that one can do. One need not become a researcher. But above all, I should say, it gives you freedom and fulfillment of mind. And I think that is very important. When I took up science, I didn't know so many things. I just thought, oh, science things you can do whatever. I think we are romantic at that stage. So I could have taken engineering because I, I should tell you at this point that when I took integrated master, I went through IIT joint entrance. And IIT J my rank was so high that I would say anything, including IIT Kanpur, electrical engineering, that kind of computer science incident in, in the 72. But I could have walked into any engineering discipline of IIT. I chose not to do. Many people said, oh, you're a fool. I chose, of course, not to go abroad immediately for PhD. Many people say that's foolish because everybody goes from IIT to yes. So I said, okay, you take make two or three foolish decisions, then you will become wise. And it's like two negatives make positive. Okay. So, so I, I, I took it in the non challenge. I'm not okay, I don't care. So I think this is very important to realize that I at least I did science because I'm free. I always thought somehow, of course, you may wonder, am I really free? Today, so much of pressure to publish. Are you really free? I mean, that is a different question that I will have an engagement. But at that point of time, I thought science means you know, you just pursue what you feel like, publish when you feel like. You know, that, that are the romantic days that we have. But I suppose today uh, it's not so. Uh, but that, that is a separate thing. Uh, we have, of course, a lot of jobs. We are talking about academic jobs, variety, ISAs, NIT, universities, college. You can get research laboratories like CSIR, PIFR, ISCS, whatever, mission driven, atomic energy, space, defense, industry RD. But what is very important is this the last one, entrepreneurs. Today, we have a lot of entrepreneurs in options, startups, and what I call deep innovation. So, deep innovation is not Jugar. I hope you know the difference between Jugar and deep innovation. Deep innovation is basically innovation based on high science. So, that is very important that today, a lot of entrepreneurship is coming up. And of course, research, international collaboration, connecting to different culture, so many other opportunities that we can think of. So I, this is just to say, why do you do science? That is very important. How do you do science? Of course, fundamental science is something that is very, very important. 
You can't do deep innovation unless there is a discovery. How do you discover? Many people will say. So if I knew, I will discover. I don't know how to discover because there is no chosen path of discovery. You can see many people think that it is curiosity. Is it always curiosity? Is it not necessity? Is it not accident? There are his historical examples where science has developed because of necessity or because of accident. Of course, very famous case of Isaac Newton is a curiosity. He saw the apple fall and then he discovered. I always wonder, had not people seen the apple fall before? Of course, a lot of people must have seen the apple fall before, but Newton asked the question why. More importantly, Newton found the answer. Even it is possible that many people have asked the question, but we didn't get the answer. We don't know that. That part of history is not known. But Newton is credited to the fact that you are curious about the apple fall. Of course, there are examples of necessity and accident which will come a little bit later uh, when I, I go through the little bit of history. So I think uh, what is important in science, of course, now I'm going to connect this to education, is education. Education is a driver for science and its application. I think that is very important. That is why ISERs are here and why you are all here. So ISERs have, of course, established the vehicles to drive science and education. But the problem is what should be the role of education? And today, you know, by the time I had made this slide, this particular slide, at least two or three years back, the world of education has already changed from blackboard to completely digital education. I said, then I said, is there a conventional discipline of education? And that is also already changing. I am actually asking the question, should we have a class of physics, chemistry, mathematics, biology? I'm not sure, or geology, art science. Should we not have a class based on a theme where a physics person will also come and teach, where a chemistry person will come and contribute? I don't know. Today, you may think, oh, it is absolutely ridiculous. But you look at any particular topic, any particular thing, there's a physics, there's a chemistry, there's a math, there's engineering. So can you think of teaching in a completely interdisciplinary manner, instead of saying 9.30 is physics, 10.30 is chemistry, and so on. I, I think that is a very important part that might happen, that the interdisciplinary approach will talk about. Otherwise, you know, it looks like completely disjoint. But probably we are talking about the same thing. One of the brilliant examples is thermodynamics. Every, every subject teaches thermodynamics. Chemistry teaches thermodynamics, physics teaches thermodynamics, engineering teaches thermodynamics, biology teaches thermodynamics. Is it different? How can the laws of thermodynamics be different? And I think that several questions, but what I'm trying to say in a theme, like let's say membrane. You know, membrane as a science, as a biology, physics, chemistry, computation, can we bring it together so people understand? We are very far from it. But maybe it will happen. One day, a complete interdisciplinary way, sorry, way of, of education. Uh, science in India, of course, I must say, yeah, sorry. Before I, yeah, so with the education comes the leadership. But is education absolutely essential to the leader? Of course, you can say political leaders, many of them are not educated. But we are not even going to that. We have we have intellectual leaders who did not have any classroom teaching. I mean, Ravindra Chagor, for example, he didn't have classroom teaching, but he was a leader. Akbar, a political leader of his time. Another example, even <laughs> spiritual leaders like Gautam Buddha. So the question is, how much education is required? Classroom teaching is required to develop leadership. It's very hard to answer. But one thing for sure, if you want to be a science leader, it's very unlikely that without education you can be a science leader. That, and that is what I will focus on. So the classroom teaching or online teaching, whichever way it is there, is very important. Then we keep discussing curriculum, who are the teachers, who are the students, how are they discussing their interactions. And I think this becomes the, the subject matter of how do you educate. What is important is that when you start your education, you are actually, the students are actually in the bottom left corner. If you look at the y and x axis, this is the quest for the fundamental understanding. This is the consideration of use. It's a very famous slide which many of you have seen, the quadrant. What is important is to come to this top right. 
what's the pursuit for? Where a high science combines with the high activities. So that's the deep innovation that I was talking about. How do you bring students from here to here? Should you put them here and then here? Should we go here and then here? Or should we have a diagonal way of going? And that has been a problem. The problem is actually, actually is highlighted by the next slide, which was a quotation by C.P. Snow as late as 1964. So not very long back. And it says that we pride ourselves that the science that we have doing could not in any conceivable circumstances have any practical use. More firmly one could make that claim, the more superior one felt. I hope you understand. There are many people who still think so. Oh, you don't understand my science, it cannot be applied. Because my science is so great, it cannot be applied. That is, anything that can be applied is useless. My science is great. And actually, that has been the problem that many people went to whole quarter and stayed there, couldn't come to Kashmir quarter. And in India, there are examples of scholars who have done very good work, couldn't make the transition. And I think this is what has been actually very nicely summarized in this particular slide, uh, this particular statement. And it says the more firmly one could make the claim, the more superior one felt. I think very interesting. And C.P. Snow was, was a great thought leader. Of course, all of you know, in science, I will not uh, uh, dwell on it. Science is an organized, systematized knowledge. You observe phenomena, faithfully record, and then you formulate them into logs and the theory, which is predictive power, and so on. I think many of you might be knowing what is the difference between postulate, law, and a theory. Postulate is just a postulate, assumption. You can't prove or disprove. Laws are certain mathematical form, like Newton's laws, just to connect. What is theory? Theory is an overarching thing when you understand the laws. So classical mechanics, when you say theory, that is an overarching thing. But Newton proposed first only laws. We simply connect. You don't understand. But they are good. So I think eventually, of course, you like to have theory. Theory should also have a predictive power. And I think that is very important. Can we predict what is going to happen? Uh, I I just want to say this, and this is not very important that there are Nobel laureates of Indian and Indian origin, not many that you can really find them. And this is why I said science in India have to catch up. We need to catch up with the Western world and uh, without forgetting that in ancient Indian science, there were a lot of good things that happened, like zero, algebra, number theory, geometry, algebra. And I have actually seen that even computer algorithms came up much before the algorithms came. Uh, I think, it's, let's not forget this, but it is very important that we have to do a catch up. So I think I don't want to say that India was not developed. The future of education post COVID, I will discuss a few slides uh, because it has become very important. And I'm going to take advantage of the UNESCO report, which actually came on the post COVID education. Maybe some of you have seen this. So I acknowledge the UNESCO report. So the post-COVID, of course, there are a lot of lessons to be learned and adapted. But now that we are coming out of COVID, I think it's very important. There's a crucial role of public education in societies, communities, individual lives. So public education has become very important that all of you know. Public health and public education are closely interconnected. I think it's important to see they show the necessity to collaborate uh, for common good. So something that we have more or less seen during the COVID more than before. We should consider that the right to education has to be broadened to encompass fluidity, capillarity, and the changing context of contemporary society. The center of any educational process, and this is the challenge I must say, is the human relationship between a student and a teacher. And that has been threatened to in the, in the post-COVID era. How do, you, how do you recover the human relationship? The mental health, and I have to say, I think many of your students, you might have felt the mental health and well being of children and youth have been greatly endangered. And in many ways, that could have lasting repercussions beyond, much beyond COVID. And I think, I mean, people who are adults, they come out of it very quickly. But those who are children at a formative stage, it will have a very long, long repercussions. So we have to understand how do we get our, particularly in schools. For example, schools have places where we must interact. We learn from and within with others to expand our understanding of being human. I think that is very important. That we are being human. 
public education cannot be dependent on digital platforms. So UNESCO, actually, this is UNESCO report that the public education just cannot be dependent on digital platforms, which are provided by private companies. Curriculum should be increasingly integrated based on themes and problems that allow us to learn to live in peace with our com common humanity and our common planet. Governments and citizens alike should be encouraged to demand strong responses, both in public health and public education. So you can see the emphasis on public health and public education. And I think that they are saying that is undergoing a huge challenge during the COVID. -19. There are a lot of long-term implications. In fact, COVID-19 has shown extraordinary human resourcefulness and potential time, but we have a time for pragmatism, quick action. But it is also a moment when more than ever we could abandon scientific evidence. How can we offer it without this? That is very important. We cannot abandon. Many people think, oh, there's a COVID, lots of rumors, we we'll do this, COVID will be okay. We cannot abandon. So let's not forget. Choices must be based on a humanistic vision of education and development and human rights. Again, many of these I'm quoting from the UNESCO report. I think those who are interested should read the report. There is a sustainable development. And I think that is a very important part. How do you connect and access to knowledge and information? And that has become extremely challenging today during the COVID. We are, in fact, the UNESCO says we cannot return to the world as it was before. It's not going to be easy. It is not going to be a simple, reversible process. That we just go back, as the COVID says. And this is something that I want to at least say the highlights instead of the details, but uh, how, this is very, very important because the open source technology, online teaching is going to remain for a long time. You know, you realize that you can get people, but we have got tech, we have understood the technology. The technology has an advantage. Technology has a lot of problems. And all of you know this, technology is throwing up the mental challenges among the youth. Advanced global solidarity, I will get big this, to end current levels of inequality. COVID-19 has shown us the extent to which our societies exploit power imbalances and our global system exploits inequalities. I think it's very important. Please understand this is a UNESCO report. And they have actually said that the inequality in the online education has become highlighted because we don't have the same, same facilities which you, everybody had access to in the classroom today. Today, we don't have that. In fact, the research has been very badly hit. COVID-19 has hit research globally, particularly experimental research has been very badly affected, and now I think people are coming out. Post-COVID, slow taking of the experimental research. They will take off, but very slowly. Social distancing, a longer-term phenomena, which will slow down the recovery. Must protect climate, and this is a major social concern. Similarly, must protect environment use of renewable energy, safe travel, that is going to be a very, very important part as, as we restart our life, as we restart our research. And I think this is a very important part because the same thing probably three or four years back, I, I would not have given those slides at all. Because we have no idea what will happen. So I think the world has changed. And every hundred years or whatever time, we have a major catastrophe, the world changes. And I think this is something very important to realize and, and I hope that we can come back uh, very easily. In Indian context, of course, the access of internet itself has become a problem. Many of you know that when you're teaching, the students are complaining. They don't have net, education, so evaluation has become a problem. So this is causing a, a divide more so in the Indian context. Of course, there's a global divide between haves and have nots. But it's a new haves and new have nots. You can have money. But you can be in a place where there is no internet connection. It doesn't, doesn't help. You are a hammer at that point of time. So there are serious implications in India. Of course, while COVID has COVID has there, we have also implemented NEP. I think let's not forget the national education policy. I must say a few lines of this that they are likely to be implemented. And this will make very deep, deep changes. Harnessing skill development, that has been one of the major highlights of the NEP. Increase employability, multiple exits. I don't know if I said to the discuss it. We have been discussing how to do exits, multiple exits, and entries. Entries is going to become a much bigger challenge than exit. It is a major challenge to attain to the digital platform. Regional languages, teach in the region. That's also another context in NEP. How do you do that? This is a major transformation that is required. 
And of course, NEP also highlights research and innovation, which is basically the thing. And I think that's very good. So a lot of things we can do. So what is innovation? I wanted to define what is innovation. Please understand that is not invention. Because many of you have heard invention, which is discovery. What is invention? When you take nature and resources to knowledge, you convert nature and resources to knowledge, that is invention. I said nature and resources. What is resources? Of course, all of you know what is resources. Your BST project, for example, or PPT project. That is your money. And you are using that money, sorry. You are using that money. You are using that money to convert to. Uh, no, no, no. You are going, you are taking the resource, converting that into knowledge. So you are publishing paper, generating knowledge. That's, of course, invention. But you can also do from nature to knowledge. And I, I quote this because a very famous story of Isaac Newton. He saw in nature the apple fell and the inspiration that came was converted to classical mechanics eventually. So, nature and resources to knowledge is what I call invention. What is innovation? Innovation is exactly reverse. The high knowledge that you gain, can you not convert this back to nature and resources? What I mean by resources is not market. Society. Can you give some product to the society? Can you give something to the nature, back to the nature? So it's a cycle, the cycle of invention and innovation. One goes from resources to knowledge, back to resources. That is innovation. So when you say we are very poor in innovation, remember, this is what I mean, that we are not able to use our knowledge and give back to the society. And that is why we are very poor. poor. We are okay in invention. I don't know how much okay, but we are okay in invention. We are trying to do some knowledge, some good papers, and so on. Innovation, for some reason, requires entrepreneurs. And that is very important. That is how the word entrepreneur came. Entrepreneurship is risk taking. Who is an entrepreneur? One who takes risk. So, in that definition, all of you are entrepreneurs. Because all of you are taking risk of some kind or other. But what is required is the knowledge to market your know, risk. And that is entrepreneurs. Very famous quotation of Swami Vivekananda. Take risks. If you win, you will be the leader. If you lose, you will be a guy. It's a very famous statement. By chance you win, okay, you will be the leader. If you fail, it doesn't matter. You can guide the next person. You avoid failure. Very famous quotation of Swami Vivekananda. Entrepreneurship, you know, those who are interested should read what is innovation. Innovation is a, it's a, it's a, it's a very big thing. There are books on innovation. What are the facts to innovation? So we want creativity to innovate, and then we go to innovation. There's a report by Fortune 500 companies that the new products account for 50% revenues and 40% of profit on the new, new on the 40% of profit side and 50% of revenues, which come from the new products. So that's very important, not Juba. 29% companies claim that they had an innovation in the last six months. You go to any company, oh, we have an innovation. But only 5% customers agree that that was an innovation. And this is a very common thing that you see that the companies claim that we have an innovation. Customers who are supposed to be the beneficiaries don't agree. Uh, that is very common. 85% ideas fail when brought to the market. Uh, but that is the nature of innovation, that most of the ideas will fail. And everyone seems to have an opinion on the image. Everyone thinks that I know what is in it. And that's very important. Everyone, that's a fact. Very interestingly, and this is a this is a result that they have done after a lot of study, that the startups somehow do innovation more correctly, more than the large companies. The large companies are actually not innovating. The innovation is already proved, they are marketing, they are scaling up. But that's not innovation. And it's a very interesting fact that very often the startups do the innovation right more than the large companies. And, and I think that's that's why I said the science is going to throw up on a very important thing. And there are students, they should know that we have an opportunity to have a startup. And that's a very serious, serious opportunity to create jobs rather than to look for jobs. You know, very often in our education, we only teach them to look for jobs. But here they can create jobs, they can create ideas, they can innovate. So it's a fantastic space. 
And, and many startups are doing well all, all, right, all over the world. And then they leave that innovation to big companies who buy them off and then they go off. They need money. They are small companies. So I, I, it's very interesting facts about innovation that I want to tell you. The, however, any innovation that you do has a fundamental science. So I am going back to the fundamental science invention. Without discovery, you don't have innovation, as I said. And there are many stories, but each story will reveal the crucial role played by basic science. So let's not forget the role of basic science. In fact, I are ah, here to actually first provide the basic science. The applications of which could not have been anticipated at the time the original research was conducted. Many of you know, including both atomic theory, lower order atomic clock, that type. And, and many others, GPS, for example. Uh, there's a lot of uh, fantastic uh, invention. Polymer, and I, I just say because again, I'm, since I'm a chemist, I'm a little bit biased by the chemistry example. Fundamental understanding of the structure of carbon atoms, the understanding and synthesizing polymers. Including bacalides are all in late 1800s, but there's a fundamental understanding of how carbon color bonds are formed. In 1920, a German scientist first proposed the correct structure for polymer as a long chain molecule. And then another scientist, while doing this, actually testing the theory, produced what is called nylon. Again, history of polymer. In the 1930s, of course, all this tremendous development of new synthetic polymers, PVC, Teflon, to name a few. And, and, and there are lots of applications, but all started with basic research. That is something that I want to tell. That the entire, and this is one example. Of course, there are several examples. The GPS is another. Today, we are using GPS left, right, everywhere. But it's an account of how basic research made possible the vital defense technology, and then a variety of importance of commercial applications. Today, we are not only looking at commercial applications, looking at map. But it's very important to realize how the GPS was impacted by fundamental basic science. And then, of course, there came satellite launching, control technology, solid state device, microchips. It's amazing to think of how much of how much of technology has come because of basic science. So basic science is a very important thing. Of course, whenever I talk about basic science, if I have a talk history, I am biased by the Newton is one person. Who was probably known, and that's a, that's I'm just quoting from the website. He's the greatest English mathematician of his generation. Forget forget physicist. The right about Isaac Newton is the greatest mathematician, English mathematician of his generation. He led the foundation for differential and general calculus. His work in optics and gravitation making one of the greatest scientists of all his life. Such a short CV. And you can see that he started differential and integral calculus. He started optics. He started gravitation. Period. And how many people we can talk about that? Starts an entirely different area. So Isaac Newton is one of the great person, a great interdisciplinary person who has actually combined mathematics and physics. Mathematics and physics, of course, have checkered history of you know, inter interconnecting with each other for years. But I can quote Isaac Newton, of course, even before that Archimedes. But Archimedes discovery was, and that's what I said, it is not a curiosity discovery. It was actually a necessity because this king has said, please tell me if my goldsmith is mixing silver in the gold. So he had to actually go back and find out the density of gold. And eventually he had to find out the volume. And the, and the, and the crown cannot be damaged because it, it was basically an irregular substance. So it, you cannot melt it to a regular shaped body. The regular bodies people knew in mathematics how to calculate volume. So then came the very famous thing of going into the bathtub, all of you know this, and the famous story of Eureka. How do we get it? But this was a necessity driven invention because he was challenged by his king. And those days he might have lost his life. All of us know that the king stand, could have killed had he not actually done it. So I think I'm just bringing out such an example. Archimedes again, who is of course, this is the word that comes in physics, but don't forget that Archimedes also is the same person who found the method of exhaustion to approximate the value of pi. He also proved that the area of the circle was equal to pi multiplied by the square of the radius of the circle, the very famous pi r square for the area. He also proved this, that this area is four by three times the inscribed triangle in the, the lower figure. What I want to tell you, the is the that can be so the great mathematics. That's all I wanted to say. And I don't want to tell mathematics things that Archimedes has done. Again, great.
great examples of mathematics and physics combining in the early days of science. Of course, today, many other disciplines are combined. And with the nanotechnology, genetic engineering, stem cell research, and cloning in the news, the science has become extremely interdisciplinary, and that is very important to realize. Uh, I will very quickly go through some just the highlights. I have not read that. And great, great discoveries you will realize. I think this is very important to be inspired. I, I am very sorry that most of the Indian universities, institute, they don't teach history of science. I think it's a very, very important course. If it is there, I'm very happy. If it is not there, you can think of introducing. Many people say there are no good teachers. It's, it's, I, I agree, it's very difficult to teach, but history of science is very important because we require role model. Why do you think people go behind cricket and all that because when it's a loser? Right? Without Kohli, they have role model. So you require role model for science. Can you bring them to the children? That is very important. So I, I will not go through, I, I am again biased by chemistry because it's impossible to tell the history of the whole of science. Oxygen, of course, is very, very important. I mean, one seven is unfortunately with an extra. Uh, <laughs> obviously, we have still not come to that here. <laughs> All right, but that's interesting. Joseph Priestley, of course, you, you discovered your, you discovered oxygen and later Anton Lavoisier, who of course is called the father of modern chemistry. Uh, and, and that was very important. John Dalton, Atomic Theory, 1808. Dalton provided a way of linking invisible atoms to generate measurable quantities like the volume of a gas, mass of a mineral. I think many of you know, it's very interesting that all of us agree, but bring them together is very, very good. Atoms combined to form molecules. Very famous uh, uh, Avogadro. Amadi Avogadro, he finds out the atoms and molecules, come, atoms and elements combined to form molecules. And of course, Avogadro proposes very, very famous law the equal volumes of gases and the equal conditions of temperature and pressure contain equal number of molecules. molecules. I, have, I always wonder how did Avogadro do this? And nobody knew what's a molecule. And he comes up with this amazing hypothesis. You know, 80, 200 years back, uh, it's amazing actually, some of this history. I said accident, so I'm bringing in an accidental discovery. Frederick Oller, synthesis of Urea, 1828. It actually started the modern organic chemistry. And all of you again know this that when we go to synthesize media from non organic substances, the living, living things. Kekule, dream. I didn't talk about dream. Frederick Kekule, they say, I dreamt of a snake seizing, seizing its own tail and came the benzene in the infrastructure. It's amazing. Mendeleev, of course, no chemistry is complete without Mendeleev's periodic table. Dimitri Mendeleev comes up with a periodic table in 18, late 60s. Electricity transforming chemical. Humphrey Davy, also Humphrey Davy, a very, very famous person, all of you know Humphrey Davy, and there's electrolysis is something that came up from there. Electron, J.J. Thompson, 1897. And in fact, today you cannot imagine life without electrons. Everywhere you think of electron. And in this, actually, electrons came only 125 years back. We didn't know electrons. Batteries were discovered in 1800. I don't know if you know this. Batteries were discovered in 1800, 100 years before electrons were discovered. And today, we all talk about electronic, electrons contributing to the conductivity. Electrons are not known when batteries came. I think it's amazing to look at the history of science. And I'm telling you, uh, those, I mean, the teachers will also get inspired, I think. Electrons for chemical bonds, of course, means both modern, modern, Quantum theory started from 1913. Of course, it was not the quantum mechanics, but eventually that went to the quantum mechanics, quantum theory, where Bohr himself contributed. Mary and Pierre Curie, very famous uh, discovery of radioactivity. Then I already talked about plastic, the bacillite, uh, John Wesley Hyatt, cellulite plastic. Uh, and of course, much later came the fullerene. Today, the, one of the important discoveries leading to nanotechnology was actually the fullerene. Uh, Robert Carl, Harold Kroko, and Greg Smalley, they discovered a completely new class of compound. And this is named for Richard Park Minister Fuller, the architect. I don't know if any of you know the architect who created the geodesic dome. And that's the reason it is called Fuller So here. So he was actually, it is actually named for an architect. Uh, and that's how it's called Fuller. And I think it's very interesting. I have separate, I have given one and a half, two hours lecture on the history of science. I'm just bringing here only a few things. Second law of thermodynamics. 
I, I said that I'm MA structure that second law thermodynamics is such a complicated subject. You know, it's very much easier as a physical chemist to teach quantum mechanics or quantum chemistry. And without any disrespect to any subject, much more difficult to teach thermodynamics. And I don't know how many people actually understand thermodynamics properly. It's a very difficult subject. And I think it, even, even Arrhenius made mistakes uh, in the thermodynamics, which just pointed out that G.L. Lewis, because of which G.L. Lewis suffered, of course. Arrhenius was a very famous person. Again, another history. Many people think that G.L. Lewis did not get Nobel Prize, but Arrhenius were upset that Lewis found out error in Arrhenius's book on thermodynamics. And Lewis was a great man. You should read Lewis's book, Lewis and Randall's book on thermodynamics. Uh, sometimes in 1880s, I don't, I, I forgotten, but in the 19th century, late 19th century, one of the first book by Lewis and Randall, and I was told, and I read it later, that the preface, I think if nothing else, please read the preface of that book. What a fantastic writing, J. Lewis had. And, and, and thermodynamics is a great subject, it's impacted all of physics, chemistry, biology, and engineering, everywhere. Of course, the quantum leap today, I don't have to talk about quantum mechanics, with the quantum technology coming up. And it's amazing that the quantum leap, Max Planck, Einstein, Werner Heisenberg, Edwin Schrodinger, although all of you know the story, again, there are lots of stories about Albert Einstein not believing in quantum mechanics. And he was kind of forced to agree that there is nothing better than, than such, a, such an artificial theory like quantum mechanics. And I think that's, an, that's a separate history by itself. How, how Wolfgang Pauli told Albert Einstein in a conference that, Mr. Einstein, you don't understand quantum mechanics, please shut up. And Einstein said, yes, Mr. Pauli, I am stupid, I don't understand quantum mechanics. I think many of us can also say that, but when Einstein said, I don't understand quantum mechanics, is not quite like our not understanding. His problem was not the mathematics. His problem was that how can this such a theory, which is which is not intuitive. I think it's a very interesting story. Uh, the Einstein, of course, Einstein himself is a great character. He also did Einstein jokes, Einstein and the chauffeur, Einstein's dress. I hope all of you know this. Einstein did not like to dress, so he he used to dress very shabbily. So his wife was very upset. He said, "You are such a famous man. Why don't you dress?" He said. Everybody knows me in Germany. That time in Germany, why should I dress? Everybody knows me. Then he went to USA. Then he said, now you must dress because USA everybody dresses. He said, very characteristically, why should I dress? Nobody knows me <laughs> in USA. So I think Einstein has a lot of interesting stories. Please read Einstein, Feynman, Richard Feynman, uh, lots of tricks. I think very interesting people. Uh, that can really you know, energize science. That's the reason I talk about the history. And the rest will all happen. Penicillin, of course, a very, very important discovery. Alexander Fleming, and I think uh, with controlled experimentation, uh, chlorian chain later find the compound pure, pure to minus with bacterial infections. So, very, very important uh, discovery of uh, penicillin. George Whiteside, a very famous scientist. He has uh, a chemist, chemical engineer. He has said that the science moves on two wheels curiosity and utility. Of course, this is again. Curiosity has been used for all of invention and utility, all of innovation in some way. And very famous statements of George Whiteside. And with that, I must say, what are the future challenges? And again, future challenges can be many. Obviously, are biased by challenges of chemistry, renewable energy, sustainable resources, energy efficient processes, affordable healthcare, environment friendly process, cultivation of land. Technology can enable different system. Many of these, and this is very, very important, will require interdisciplinary expertise of science. Although chemistry may play a central role, they may be in the center, the art of interdisciplinary. You cannot work on renewable energy without engineering. I mean, it's very important. Without physics, similarly, biology. There are so many biological services. So I think there are a lot of interesting challenges. But with those challenges, we have the opportunities to have innovative solutions. Many of these challenges are not solved, including renewable energy, protection of climate and environment. So we have to do today very important tasks in biology and pharma. All of us know this. I don't have to emphasize how important research in biology and pharmaceutical have become. We always knew they're important, but the COVID has suddenly shown us 
Many of these have will be made easy by what I call smart materials. Smart materials as a general theme. What is important is also communication today because of COVID. And I talked of innovation in education and laboratories, which I already talked about. One of the great integrators, and I'm not saying because I'm a computational activist, uh, without changing gear, I must say one of the great integrators has been computational science. Computation, computer enabled tools. When you're using you know, Zoom, Google Meet, they're all computer. They're all technological model based on computer science. So, and, and of course, there's a difference from computer and computational science. I hope all of you know that. I'm talking about here computational science. A solution must come from the three R's, theory, experiment, and computation. And together, we have to find the solution. And it's very, very important realize. I distinguish, of course, for those uh, who know, I'm distinguishing in theory and competition. I don't have to emphasize why I distinguish. Many of you know these two are, to me, are different arms. But theory alone is not sufficient. Unless it's, it's, it, it, it is uh, kind of complemented or verified or prior experimental art. And of course, computation is always going to be an important. Even experimentalists are coming to computation. So all together, I call it a computational science which is basically integrating to it, the, the, the solution, integrating education. Like many developments in art and culture, remember scientific discoveries too can seldom be foreseen, and I have said this before, and certainly not planned. Unfortunately, we have to write plans, five-year plan, I don't know, projects, so you have to tell what you will do in the next three years, four years, and I always wonder, can you do that? If you know what is going to be the result after four years, why, why are you doing it? I mean, obviously, you don't know. So they suddenly cannot be planned. They grow out of the creativity, courage, and intellectual independence. And I'm coming back to that. Our researchers and research group who dare to trade new scientific territory. And I think it's very important to say this. We are not able to do this, but it's very important to state this. Because let's not forget it. Frequently, basic research results in key insights that fundamentally change our lives. And that is what I have shown. By example, how the fundamental changes are taking place. So one of the major, one of the major things is, and this has been a philosophy of the Max Planck Institute from inside to application. Many say from concept to market, from bench to market. You can put any names you want, but I think the, the whole idea is very clear. You must have good insight, and then only application can come. So both invention and innovation must go hand to hand. And I think. The, the, the range of the topics also must be constantly refined. Many people want to remain on one topic for 30, 40, 50 years. It's not possible. You know, things are changing. So what is required is to go from puzzles to problems. And I think this is a very well beaten slide, which I want to again show. We are very good in puzzles. What I've given is puzzles. 1 minus 1 plus 1 minus 1 plus 1 minus 1, sum up in pink. Well, I mean, said mathematics will be a problem. Uh, those are good students, we'll solve it. Okay, I, I don't want to ask a solution here. You have two buckets, one of them has five liters, one of them has seven liters. Using only these two buckets can measure volume from one to the other. I think you can all do this. There is no other measurement. You just have five liters and seven. So you can pour like seven liters full. Pour it into five liter, that's two liter. So seven and five arithmetic will give you all the numbers. You know, I, I think you can try doing this. I just did say, okay, you can we solve many, many such problems, they are called puzzles. In India, we are very good in solving puzzles. So we get gold medals in Olympia, here and there, but what we require is to solve problems. And that is what I said. As soon as we come to problems, our puzzle schemes don't work. Problems require collaboration. Problems requires interdisciplinary. You have to be good in maths, that's not going to help. And the problems of energy, problems of sustainable resources, energy efficient buildings is a very, very important part. And today we are constructing. How many of us are able to construct energy efficient buildings? And buildings when you don't need lights. The buildings where sunlight will fall, and that will generate electricity. There will be coating technology. A lot of people are doing that, you know. I have seen this in Germany. There are buildings where the, the window panes keep moving as the sun moves. 
in the same. So, if there is a crack here, what will happen? Professor Murti has to call in India. Why is there a crack? Get it correct. So, is it possible that he can sleep? And the engineer will know from the house that there is a crack. It's possible to be online with the computer. Exactly where the GPS technology, he, the engineer will know. Even better, the engineer also knows they have to come. This will be auto corrected. And you think of that, you think it's absolutely ridiculous? No, it's not. This is exactly the topic of sensors and actuators. There's a journal called Sensors and Actuators. You sense, you actuate, you correct it. So those will be very efficient buildings. So can you think of energy efficient buildings? Environment friendly process, like talked of, and affordable healthcare. That's very, very important today, of course. But what I'm saying, these are problems. This will have, the, the correcting the crack will require chemistry, engineering, flow, everything. That there will be crack, there will be sensor, immediately something will flow here. So there will be somewhere else where there will be reservoir materials which will come here. I don't know, I'm just thinking about it. Okay? Uh, and of course, you need a good engineer. But these are the problems that I'm talking about. And I think that's something that we need to do. We have to move from puzzles to Solution. So sustainable forms of solar, wind, fuel cell, hydrogen is a very, very important problem, uh, bio-waste, alcohol, chemical, etc. And all of these can be achieved by what I call smart materials. Many of you have our smart materials. There are people who are working here. A lot of people are working in materials uh, within the chemistry. Uh, smart materials are man-made materials which are intact. That's important. Of course, natural world has dumb materials and materials which are eaten. The dumb materials are like table. This is a dumb material. With no response. Whereas plants have a response. Can you make a material which have response? And that is what is called generally smart material, very intelligent material, the material the structure which could be engineers and report on its problems. That's what I said. Or having the ability to counteract unwanted conditions. So that will be a smart building. That it corrects itself automatically. We are far away from that. So the development of novel materials is very, very important thing. And chemistry, physics, engineering, all that thing, new materials have to be developed uh, for renewable sources of energy, convert them to electrical thermal energy. So that's the renewable. Chemistry will, of course, play a major role. Again, I'm a chemist, so I'm very proud to say that all disciplines will play, of course, but chemistry will play a major role. In developing and designing such novel materials in various fields like biofuels, fuel cells, solar energy, etc. In fact, if you look at this is a fuel cell, you know, we're talking about alkaline fuel cell, you have polymer exchange membrane, direct membrane, DMFC, phosphoric acid, so many fuel cells, solid oxide fuel cell, lots of applications of fuel cell have come up. The membrane, membrane technology is very, very important. Some application of fuel cell cars running, hydrogen power car, basically. Cars are running. In fact, I have myself got into a hydrogen fuel cell bus uh, in Piccadilly, actually, in 2012, I remember. It was a demo bus. They took us free just to show that it's hydrogen power. Very interesting. Uh, and it's there. And then, you know, laptop charging, solar, mobile charging. So very interesting things that, that will happen as an application. Of course, solar energy has a tremendous potential. And that is, of course, very, very important. Artificial photosynthesis. Uh, can we do that? I mean, very, really, really, it's a key process. And it's a very first step in understanding the natural world would utilize solar power. So, so that's a very simplified sketch of an artificial photosynthesis. And a lot of chemistry work is going on, as you know. I and mean, how, how, do you, how do you do this oxidation reduction process, the O2 evolution, hydrogen evolution, uh, the energy transfer, and the natural world not do it so easily. I mean, that is something that we have to learn. And the solar powered windows, I already talked about new development in solar powered window is the first of its kind, which enables see through windows to generate electricity by just paying the glass surface with new energy, electricity generating coating. That's what I said. The coating technology is becoming very, very important today. Uh, light emitting diet. I think all of you know LED, you're using all LED TV, LED technology, but remember, silicon itself is a very poor conductor. How do they become a good conductor? They dope them. So you have a group three or group five elements, you dope them, and you have P and N type semiconductor. And that is used in digital cloud, remote controls, everywhere, jewelry, 
whenever you read your flashlights, television screen, P and N type conductors, all color, of course, depends on what you can use and what kind of silicon. So that is very important. But don't forget, it's all silicon technology we say, but silicon itself is not a good conductor. It's a little bit of doping, but a little bit of doping, not impurity. I hope all of you know materials are doping and impurity. So and I also say when in life, pure life is a little bit boring, a bit of doping makes life interesting. I also say as a joke, uh, please don't try that. <laughs> don't dope yourself. But, but what I'm trying to say, the material science is full of dope. Not, not just pure materials. So all these requires enabling chemistry. Atomic and molecular inside, new synthetic tools, very important in chemistry, bond making and bond breaking, combination of organic and inorganic chemistry with physical chemistry or physics as a rule. Today we are talking about bio-inspired chemistry, chemical biology, and again, computational science, I must say, emerging as a major tool, which I didn't see even 10 years back, the way it is emerged today, computational science. When I say computational science, I don't need to say chemistry. It's a physics, biology, the tools are same. Many things are even used in engineering. So these are the emerging areas. Before I just uh, finish my talk, uh, with two or three slides of my own, research, just two, three slides. Energy materials, novel pharma, Renewable sources, hydrogen energy, we are also doing hydrogen energy. The computation, onboard storage, CO2 activation is a very, very important problem. And I'll just show that. Uh, I, I also got into it thanks to one of my collaborators. Synthetic biology. Many of you, of course, know, and that's what I've been talking. How does biology help in this? How does biology, real life, is doing things much more easily? And of course, the environment is being normal. I get keep doing the new normal, it's going to keep coming back. How do you protect the environment? Innovative ways to carry out research in the new normal. I think that is going to become a very important thing. And I, I put that down in the areas. I will close by just giving three slides, exactly three slides of my research. So I just want to tell, it will be very unfair to just give a talk without telling. I'm a many people in TI, he's just not doing any science. I know. Many people feel like that for directors particularly. So I'm very apologetic when I'm director because many people may have a wrong impression that this is the director, he doesn't do anything. I don't know whether that person Murti feels, I feel very <laughs> apologetic. So I must say that I've been very active, actively pursuing science. Uh, so some of the science that I'm doing, as Professor Murti said, was methodological advances. And I call this highly correlated electronic structure method, right results for the right reasons. And I think it's very, very important to realize. Is, it is easy to get a right result, but maybe for a wrong reason. Because you have error cancellation. And that will not work for another system. So our methodological advances are actually to emphasize right result for right. And we have been doing that for now, I've been doing that for 30 years. But what is important to realize that these are the last few years, the last four or five years, we have started the relativistic couple cluster theory, which I've been doing for a long time. And very interestingly, we have identified certain materials like mercury hydride, very high dipole moment, which is not possible unless you use relativistic method. And of course, the couple cluster, which is extremely accurate. Radium fluoride as a parity and time reversal violating interaction. Plasma screening effects on multiple charge aluminum. Lead fluoride, we have actually looked at electron nuclear scalar, pseudo scalar interaction, which is extremely important. Very recent works, I think some of them have gone down in even 2021, we published. Then we have also looked at bound state couple cluster method for resonance and decay. Very, very recently, we I wrote a journal of physical chemistry, invited teacher article. I'm not getting time to write actually, but COVID allowed me the time. Sitting at uh, sitting, uh, getting more time in the beginning, March April you know, 2020, I could finish the new one. It was the invited teacher article. We have done first excited state resonance. This is very, very hard to do. In excited states are very hard. Here yeah, we are talking about the resonance state, not bound state. So with what I call complex absorbing potential couple cluster, uh, we publish that in molecular physics and, and several things that we keep on. I'm also working on uh, materials, as Professor Bukti said, computational material science, functional clusters and materials. I will not go into this, but we started very early days into a team beta zeolite, which is a very good oxidation catalyst. People in our LCL was doing titanium. In fact, Mal and Ramasami, I remember seeing the paper, I think in 2001, when they first synthesized TNB Nazionite uh, and showed that it's a very good oxygen catalysis, and then I kind of went into this to show where the team waiting structures in Vita Zeolite. 
we looked at the first and very importantly among the first mixed metal clusters aromaticity and anti aromaticity because all, everybody thought aromaticity is a organic molecule features but we showed even for simply all metal clusters you can have aromaticity or anti aromaticity like li4 la4 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 these are anti aromatic actually and we found that here it's not high aromaticity but sigma aromaticity is more important and you know we published some of the papers then a lot of papers on gold and aluminium clusters for catalysis we published quite a few papers they have been keep publishing very recently also endo reduction then of course hydrogen storage materials and and you know very very few very recent work on functional materials we have looked at co2 reduction using pinsar complex and i have been inspired actually i'm very happy to say uh with uh, the is actually working in a college in pune has introduced me to the problem she's an expert in pinsar complex and who's an organic chemist moved into a computational chemistry so she published the first paper on her own in organic chemistry that is, is really creditable and then of course I, I i also collaborated with her but this is a project which is actually driven by her i didn't know much about pinsar complex to be honest and they could be a very good catalyst for co2 reduction uh, independently, I started working on blue phosphorine, metal dichalcogenides, and anode materials in batteries, lithium as well as sodium batteries. And quite a few papers have been publishing, published another recently, another paper in PCC is just coming up. So I think it's very interesting to see how the dichalcogenides, like uh, sulfide, selenide, and also heterostructures with blue phosphorine. Uh, uh, is proving to be a very good other material. So many of these are, of course, computational work which predict materials and which will hopefully ex uh, ex experiment it upon. All right, so with this, I think I will stop because I've taken more than a, yeah, just about four minutes extra. I started at 45 past. So I will stop here. And I want to say that I said that there are a lot of opportunities for international collaboration. Science throws up on lots of opportunities, and that's what I want to end with. You know, lucky that you can go travel. Uh, young age, I hope you can recognize me. Who am I? Uh, that's me. <laughs> uh, I don't know if I'm, I have any, any semblance to that now. <laughs> that's me. That's me. That's me. All right, in various places, in, from Praha to this is in USA to Japan. In Monte Carlo. So, I, what I want to say that the science also gives you beautiful opportunities, freedom, and fulfillment of mind. You go for research, you see places, see culture, and I think that is also a very, very important outcome of the science that I have got, uh, the outcome that I have received from the science. And I think many people will say it's a very interesting thing to know different cultures. I, I learned with the very famous story of Tagore. And I think that's very important for science, where the mind is without fear and the head is held hard and knowledge is free, where the world has not been broken up into fragments and narrow domestic walls. And I think it's very important in Indian context to remind ourselves this point. Where words come out from the depth of truth and then we let, where the mind is led forward by D, I think there is an extra D, D into ever widening cotton axis. I hope you all of you know what is D. Into that heaven of freedom, my father let my come here. With this, I'll close now. Okay. I think, uh, let's see if we have some questions from the audience. I'm sure Professor uh, Sorobal will be glad to. Hey, sure. I see no, yeah, you know, a science uh, institution. We are used to listening to the lectures in the chosen discipline. But in a general topic like this, you keep listening to the, uh, the person who is speaking. Then if you try to reflect on what happened, then we were telling you about the blah blah lecture. <laughs> <laughs> it's like blah 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 is part of, and you keep, you know, you are hooked up, you are charged up, and at the end you look back and how much can you really consolidate? A few parts really get settled in your mind. There's no question. Right, uh, but I think we are used to assimilating the matter in, in, the, in, in the social discipline much more crisply. But this is like started off with some kind of a post COVID challenges, right? And then uh, talking about uh, what is science, 
uh, innovation and invention, the differences, the history, history of science itself. And they're talking about a lot of uh, developments. And what he said is right, I think we should have some kind of lectures on uh, history of science. Most often, of course, also the science institution. And how often do we remember the, the popular contributions in science in the question of I think we get lost. All of us have studied and we have to forget also. So from that point onwards, I think a professor sort of well, took us through really the challenges that the, uh, the world is faced with and what are the uh, great challenges, the opportunities that exist for all of us. And uh, to, towards the end, giving a glimpse into his own science, I think he's, he's really charged. I think several times that I've heard him, I don't know where he draws the strength from at the age of 67, 68 that he came himself. <laughs> <laughs> I don't think, you know, I think you can, you can get him free for another two hours and I'm sure you will see the same at the end of the year, so two hours, right? Uh, it's a very stimulating talk. If you have some questions, we'll take the questions. If not, do you have any, any, have, any have questions? Or anybody online, I don't know. I think let me ask you this question. Everywhere people talk about innovation, innovation. So everybody talks, starts working on only innovation. <laughs> yeah. In every yeah. way. No innovation will come without invention. Right. I said right. the first part is invention, then only. otherwise it will become juba. So I you have to have the basics of basic science. I find innovation. I mean, first, first produce knowledge. Then only knowledge to market. The problem is that we are just talking about. There is nobody to take it for. Of course, for one person to invent an innovation is not easy. But as a society, we must invent an innovation. So that so innovation doesn't mean that you start from do anything product. That is a mistaken, that's the Edison quarter. So that's the Edison quarter. That's only Richard Guru first you And that is important. But I always thought of those SATV schools are really bright. Let's see if we have some pushes in the backside, guys. I will see some students. Yeah, exactly. That's what I mean. need some kind of a stimulation, right? <laughs> I yeah. must also thank a lot of my friends whose names I've seen. It's almost impossible to read them out. But whenever this page is coming, a lot of my friends are here online. Hello, sir. Yes. Okay. Yes. Sir, you had uh, briefly mentioned about the mental health issues caused for me. Yeah. So I would like to know what your thoughts on are uh, how the higher education institutes like ISIS are dealing with this issue. Yeah, so of course this is a very serious problem. And I it is a it is an issue which we have not dealt with. As an administrator, I think you want to see that. Uh, as an administrator, we haven't dealt with. So all of us are trying to find out. Of course, you have a mental wellness care, counselor, psychologist, so so many things are cool. But eventually you have to realize that. Even they have not seen anything like this. Even the counselors are saying that they have also not seen it. So they are trying their best. So a very important part is to hold help at this point. So wherever there is a possibility of helping them, we are trying to do that. But obviously, the scars that will be left are very deep, mental. But there will be other scars which will be left, which are intellectual. The fact that they have not come to the class for two years. The fact that you have not interacted, I said that, that in the report, you have not interacted with peers where you deny knowledge by talking. And that's a very, very serious loss. And that is that is something that I think will take six, seven years to come out, apart from just the mental problem. The mental problem eventually people will come. Of course, a lot of people unfortunately lost the family, lost lives in family. That's the irreparable loss, I must say. And that has caused different kind of mental problems with young people, young children. So many of them are not able to give exam, many of them are, are losing classes. And I'm sure all your faculties, including us, we are trying to help. We certainly have told my faculty also, please be as much considerate as possible. I think we're all trying to do that. But yeah, I mean, it is something that is simply new. As it comes, you have to adapt and do. There's no harm here. Because we have never seen anything in our lifetime. Even when the Spanish flu came, you know, I don't know how they handled it. They're quite different. And uh, today our expectations are very different from that time. So this mental, I always said mental health, bad mental health occurs always from expectations to what you get. That is one very important. Of course, immediate loss in the family is disastrous. 
immediate problems and disasters. But you expect something and you get something else, even on that, which is very much less. So those days only people didn't expect and didn't expect to live long also. I mean, today our expectations are much longer, much higher. We didn't, I, we don't, I don't know if you know Spanish school, how many people died, which is much larger, much larger. I and mean, with that smaller population 100 years back, the death was amazingly high. So we are, we are far, you know, COVID will never expect. Figure, I'm pretty sure. But it happened. And yeah, I mean, people have lived through that life. I was told Mahatma Gandhi had COVID. Had COVID. Had Spanish flu. He lived through. Some people couldn't live through. In fact, Mahatma Gandhi, there is a separate history of Mahatma Gandhi pre Spanish flu, post Spanish flu. Mahatma Gandhi himself got transformed. But he went through. Tagore did not suffer from flu. And they all lived to the generation. They have to remember. They lived 1918, 18, 18, 18, 18, 18, 18, 18, 18, 18, 18, 18, 18, 18, 18, 18, 18, 18, 18, 18, 18, 18, 18, 18, 18, 18, 18, 18, 18, 18, 18, 18, 18, 18, 18, 18, 18, 18, 18, 18, 18, 18, 18, 18, 18, 18, 18, 18, 18, 18, 18, 18, 18, 18, 18, 18, 18, 18, 18, 18, 18, 18, 18, 18, 18, 18, 18, 18, so the startup company business that you mentioned and entrepreneurship is a very important uh, part. Yeah. In the West, we know that a large number of academicians do that. Many. Yeah. 50 to 20 percent at least time do that. Time do that. Unfortunately, in our country is not so much. No. I think that with the with the SFB being there, you know, the small investor bank, it should be properly encouraged. Uh, I mean, why is it so? One of the reasons, of course, is that we will pray for the academic recognition. So they, they sort of sideline the, the uh, entrepreneurship and startup thing. But it should be encouraged because there are a lot of people who get very good results and they, uh, they leave it as it is. I know. So the problem in our country, I think that culturally, we don't want to take the risk of this kind. Those were, we, we take risk, of course, in life. Shota, shota, we, we are entrepreneurs also. We look at go to Gujarat. We will see almost everybody's entrepreneur. They have little money, they will open a shop, right? So that's also an, in a way entrepreneurs. But that's not innovation that I'm talking about. So it's not that we don't take this, but we don't, those who have come to this stage of invention, knowledge, they don't want to further risk their career. Because they have a reputation to protect, they're more worried about that. But they are the middle of it, we'll take a risk of startup and trade. So that culture, I think, have to set it. This I, I have a feeling is not the money that is not available. Today, government is giving a lot of grant, and the risk is minimal because you are getting grant. You are not getting your putting your own money to start up. I think that I must say that today, government is giving grant, so you can afford to fail. That is very important. Uh, so I, I have a feeling. Yeah, I, I think it's all cultural also. You know, apart from the fact that there are more difficulties. So. Of course, starting a company, registering a company, they're difficult, which are not so smooth process. That could be another reason. But it's important that, uh, yeah, the, 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 the risk taking has to, I think it is already happening. I think I find the most yes, startups. Yes, we are doing that. I find that the most startups are already coming. So it will happen in the next 10, 50 years. That more and more startups will come. And as I said, the report also said the startups are more likely to innovate than the big companies. Big companies are actually taking less risk. They will, they will not take it because they are only looking at the profit. Yeah, I think uh, if there are no questions, I'm, I'm sure you all agree with me that uh, it was a really charged up uh, talk. Yeah, and yeah, we yeah. really. I don't think so. I'm raising hand. Can you yeah. see that? I'm not sure. Yeah. So we know we are not taking any questions now. Right? Okay. So it was a fantastic talk. I think very stimulating indeed. He has left us with a lot of, lot of thoughts to sort of uh, reflect on the challenges that are presented, and I'm sure all of us take home uh, fantastic messages from those as well. Please join me in, in uh, thanking you for the Yeah. Thank you. I also take this occasion uh, you know, uh, to sort of present with him a small. Uh, Token in appreciation of this fantastic talk is joining me.
Thank you all for attending and thank you all my friends and people who are attending. Our event. I can't see them. Thank you all. No, no, I not. I not. I heard him. Thanks. No, he's still standing. Come on, come on. 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 Come on.